And then this morning, I, I've just been reminded over and over and over again by our team about how much God loves you and how much God is for you. We had people coming this morning boiling water in this thing they call a donkey, which is a big water boiler percolator thing. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, we've had people show up and, you know, just get the generator going. My Datsu for Rosa is currently powering the church because it's connected to the generator, which has got the lights and everything on right now. So we're, we're praying over that. But I just spent this morning watching the team just come together, uh, watching our, our people upstairs in tech get things working and and people coming in when they're not supposed to come in to get other environments working. I'm just blown away. I'm just always reminded. You know, today we're talking about love and we're talking about God's love. And I just think it's fitting that, that I, I had this wonderful reminder this morning. That in, in my flesh and in my doubt and in, in the humanity of, of, of me thinking that I have anything to do with God showing up here in this church. That I could show up this morning and be reminded by God's love through you through you, the church, the actual church, and what you've done to make this morning happen. So I just want to first say thank you for encouraging me today. And I want to also give you permission that, hey, it's okay if you struggle with whether or not God loves you, if you struggle with whether or not God can love people. I mean, that's what we're talking about today. But before we answer those questions, I first want to ask you guys this question. Okay, so now I'm going to actually get into the message. So the first question that I'll ask you is, what is it like to be loved? This is a feeling that feels amazing. This is, this is, I mean, think back to the first time that you felt loved by somebody. You get the butterflies in your stomach. Um, you know, you get kind of the tingles. You start to kind of, you know, feel like the warm fuzzies. If you were like me, you got really sweaty. If you're between the ages of like 14 and 19, maybe you get really awkward. You know, you don't know what to say or how to act. But this feeling of being loved is so amazing when you realize that somebody like loves you. And the easiest context to put this into is like the context of dating. You know, you, you first start dating somebody, that first time someone says that, hey, I love you, that first time you realize, you know, hey, I want you to be my girlfriend. I'll, I'll tell you the first time that, that I asked a girl out, I was in grade five, and I was away on a, I know, I know, I was away on a, we were away on a school camp. And, and I remember uh, having this girl that I had a, a crush on, and I didn't actually talk to her, but through a network of friends, my words made it to her. And so the plan was, was she was going to bend over to tie her shoe, and when she bent over to tie her shoe, then I would walk up and say, hey, would you be my girlfriend? And then I had assuredness from my friends that she would say yes, and so I went through the process and sweaty, you know, I was this tall, this wide, and I walk up, and I, I say, you know, hey, she bends over, she's tying her shoes, so would you be my girlfriend? She said yes. Never spoke to her again. No, <laughs> nothing ever came out of that. But that feeling of, like, I feel alive. Like, I feel like, ah, you know, I could do anything. You know, she said yes. This feeling of like loved, I mean, it's amazing. It invigorates us. It gives us life. It, it lifts us up. I mean, that's the, the power and the influence that we have over each other just when we feel loved. I mean, it drives us. So the other question, the flip side of this is what is it like to feel rejected? Yeah, that's the hard feeling. That's the one that's like, man, I mean, there's almost nothing worse than feeling rejected by somebody. Or feeling rejected by, by um, a relationship or a spouse, a loved one, a friend. This feeling of being rejected, I mean, this is horrible. This will put people in bed for days. This will put ice cream, you know, out on the coffee table with you. This is what drives you to listen to that music, you know, that just makes you feel down and makes you feel, feel sad, you know, because... I'm more and more into like the gym world and the weightlifting world. Like there are people that say it's this feeling of rejection that fuels them to work harder in the gym. And I'm like, man, that's horrible. Like, I, you know, you got to go through a lot of pain just to put on some muscle. But that, but that, this feeling of rejection, it, dri it drives you deep. And I think we can all identify. We've all had a time in our life where we've felt, you know, rejected by love and the way that that's impacted us and, and how that's made us feel. And so you've got this great feeling of what it's like to be loved. You've got this horrible feeling of what it's like when you're rejected. But then there, there's kind of this, this other group of people that I would, I would ask you about. And it's, 
It's, do you know someone who's, who's actually impossible to love? You may be sitting next to them. You may have accidentally married them. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys have got some good energy this morning. This is, this, is, this is great for me. Yeah, I mean, there are people that are impossible to love. That they feel like they're impossible to love. You know, maybe it's because they're hurt and they can't receive your love. Or, or maybe it's because they, they just have, they spent so much time alone. Or, or there's something that's happened in their life and it's made them really hard to love. We work with people like this. There are people that at one point were easy to love and now they've become really hard to love and impossible to love. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know anyone in my life that's impossible to love, you're probably the one that's impossible to that's impossible to love and and the, the the other thing that I think about with this right here this is what resonates with me this is the thing that gets me okay is that sometimes I find that I am impossible for me to love myself you know that that that's that's the other part of this are you is it possible for you to love yourself is it possible for you to receive love from, from yourself? What's your relationship with yourself like? See, Casey and I, we have this, we talk about this thing called created order. And, and it's this, this kind of, it's like a, a pyramid. It's okay, first, it's, it's your relationship between you and God. And then it's your relationship between you and yourself. And then your relationship between you and your spouse or your significant other. And then your relationship between you and your family. And then it's your relationship between you and kind of your extended network. And so there, there's, yes, can I be loved by God? Can, can I accept God's love for me? Sure, maybe. But then when you move down the pyramid, am, am I impossible to love myself? Is it possible for me to love me? Is it possible for me to let God love me? So fortunately, God makes this very clear for us in Scripture. He answers these questions for us, and He doesn't leave any shadow of doubt to it. He gives us extremely concrete and extremely dependable answers. The, the first one is, is John 3.16. Let's check this verse out here. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized. Okay, so loved. So God is loving. God has loved the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have everlasting life. So there's a verse that many of us know, even those that, that haven't grown up in the church or spent a lot of time in church, you've heard some reference to John 3.16. But, but the simple truth behind this is, is this, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. God so loved us that he gave his son to die for us, meaning that we are loved by God because Jesus did come, Jesus did die for us. This is recounting an action that happened Therefore, the love that God has for you is a guarantee that's already been given. So all we have to do is accept this. But, but this is hard. This is really hard. And this leads us to the question that, that we're ultimately asking today. And this is the last in a series of questions that we've been asking over the last couple of weeks. And it's this question of, does God love me? Now, as I thought about this more and more and more as I was preparing for this message and thinking about this question of, of, does God love me? The easy answer is, well, yes, I know God loves me. I'm in church. Or yes, I know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that, that he gave his, his only begotten son for us. Like, I, I know all that stuff. But I always ask myself the question, okay, I may know the Bible knowledge of this. But how do I, especially something as easy and as simple as this, of all the questions that we've asked, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why does God let people go to hell? Why does God let sin exist? We've asked some big questions in this series, and we've gotten some good answers to it. And of all the questions that we ask, this is the simplest question to answer, but it's the hardest question for us to actually grasp onto and then apply it to our lives. See, I go back to that moment of, is it possible for you to love yourself? Those moments where it's impossible for you to love you, you go to this question, well, wait, but does God love me? Well, God sent his son to die for me. It's like we're so disconnected as people. We're so disconnected from what Jesus did on the cross for us. 
that, that this doesn't have as much weight and as much authority in our lives as God intended for it to have in our lives. But see, it's important that we understand that God loves us. So I've prayed all morning for, for you. My heart is, is broken for you this morning. And especially with load shedding and all that's happened and, and the number of times that we've tried to restart a generator and all that stuff, I just keep thinking there's somebody here today that needs the answer to this question of does God love me? Does God love me? And this is so important because, see, your life on earth and your afterlife, they absolutely depend on the love of God. Let me just say that to you again. Your life here depends on your understanding of God's love for you. Is life good? Is life bad? Is life hard? How do you handle adverse situations? How do you handle arguments in your family? How do you handle just reality? When when reality comes up against you, when the bills stack up, when you don't have the money you think you should have, when, when life happens on earth, how does that impact you? And then there's the afterlife part. You know, we talked about earlier in the series about hell existing and hell being a real place. What happens after you leave this earth? When, you, when your soul leaves your body here, it goes somewhere. It goes to heaven. It goes to hell. It's going to go somewhere. It doesn't sit in the ground. It doesn't become fertilizer. And so your understanding of God's love for you impacts that. So I, I just want to pause before we move on in the message. And I know this is, this is kind of heavy, but I want this to feel heavy to you. Because this is such an easy question to write off. I know God loves me. But I still feel this way. I still feel bad. I know God loves me, but I still can't handle Monday morning. I know, yes, I know that God loves me. Send his son to die for me. But it'd be even better if my car worked or my car started. Or if, if we got paid and didn't get retrenched and laid off. I know that God loves me, but why did my spouse leave or cheat on me or why am I going through this divorce? I know God loves me, but see we add this but in there. And when we add the the but statement in there, it's disqualifying everything that Jesus did on the cross for us. And that's not because we're bad. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you for doing that. There's nothing wrong with you for feeling the way that you feel. It's so hard to feel and accept God's love because God's not standing right here in front of you. And so it's hard to accept that. And I want, you to give you permi- I want to give you permission to feel that way. So often when we think about God and when we think about His love, what we also try and do is we try and put it in a box. So we try and say, okay, God's love would look like this or it would look like that. God's love, if He loved me then this would happen. If he loved me, then this person would say yes when I asked him out. If God loved me, then I would get this job. If God loved me, then, then my house, the roof would not leak. If God loved, See, we have this idea of what it is for God to love us. And therefore, when that expectation isn't met, then we think maybe God doesn't love us. But see, I want to kind of clear it up. There's two kinds of love. There's two major kinds of love. And the first kind of love that we're going to talk about is, is it's a love that loves because something is, is, is valuable. An object has value or an object is worthy. A love that loves because an object is valuable or worthy of that love. You know, there, there's some cars out there that, that would fit this for me. I, I would love, if I had like a, a 2023, I love those new defenders that are out there. You know, somebody in the church wants to bless me with that. I just will tell you that I will love it. I'll love it every day because it's valuable. It's worthy. It costs a lot of money. You know, those things that you work really hard for, that renovation that you've done at your house, those new kitchen countertops, the the vehicle that you drive. Maybe it was always a dream of yours to have have a, a Rolex or a certain watch or a certain wardrobe or a house in a certain area, and you've worked hard for it, and you've earned it, and you've put everything you have into it, and you love it because it's valuable. It's worth money. It's a good investment. So the value of the thing or the object is why you love it. It's expensive. It's nice. 
Now, the, the, the second kind of love that I want to talk about flips this totally on its edge. And it's a love that gives value to an object simply because it is loved. So this is where an object has value because you love it. If you were to take your love away from it, it would lose its value. I've got a perfect example for you. We, we've got a picture here of, of one of my first loves. This is my uh, Toyota Hilux. Andy, you'll appreciate this here. This, this is, this is my, my Hilux. So I had this in 2013, 2015. I had this for a couple years. It's not a valuable vehicle. It, it wasn't worth a lot of money. When I bought it, it, it was already broken down. It had Corn husk stuck under it because a farmer had run it off the road. Had all kinds of issues with it. But, but I absolutely loved this vehicle. It was something that, that I put a roof rack on. And I had spare wheels and fuel cans. And this picture was actually taken on the Skeleton Coast in, in, in Namibia. But I loved this vehicle. I loved it so much. I'll show you another picture of it. <laughs> there's... there's there, there's me driving in, into, into Namibia. It's the last bit of tar road, and I'm headed into Namibia for a, a bit of an adventure. And I just want you to know, this truck took me all over southern Africa. Zimbabwe, Zambia, Lesotho, Swaziland, um, Botswana. I drove right down through the Okavanga Delta in this thing. I loved this thing. And it was worth nothing. And it broke down all the time. In fact, in this exact picture here, I had a blown head gasket. And I just drove it anyway. This, this truck had, had, had no... It was, it was almost worthless. But I loved it. If you've been around KC9, you know our story. This is the, the, the truck, or as you guys would say, the Bucky. This is the Bucky that, that, that when I asked Casey out, when I told her, Hey, I feel like you know we are... Uh, supposed to be in a relationship together. I was giving her a hug at the door, and as I was hugging her, I was looking over her shoulder, and this was parked in, in her yard. And I just said, man, that thing is beautiful. And she, she thought I was talking about her, and I was like, isn't, isn't my Baki just awesome? You know, look at that thing. I loved it. Because I loved it, it has so much value. Even as I look through pictures, I think of all these, these valuable moments, these special moments, and, and it just for me. And, and now I'll show you the saddest picture. Um, this is the day that it died. <clears throat> there was a couldn't fix it, no more head gaskets, no more. I mean, this thing was totally dead. This is the last day I ever drove it. And uh, this is on the road between um, Nelsprit and Swaziland, and it broke down. I pulled over. It was loaded up on this vehicle, and I never sat in it again. It was a sad, I know. Very, very sad day. Very sad day. But that was because I loved it. See, th this vehicle was flawed. It, 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 didn't, it, it had all kinds of issues with it. It was scratched. It was dented. It had issues, some of the things inside didn't work. But this thing was, was super messed up. But it was valuable because I loved it. So now to relate that to, to us, see, we're flawed, we're broken, we're sinners, we're wounded, we're full of imperfections. Yet, see, before I talked about the, the but statement, I know God loves me, but that means or that should. And see, what God says is, you're flawed, you're broken, you're a sinner, you're wounded, you're full of imperfections, yet I love you. See, it's because that God loves us that we're valuable. It's not because we're without flaw. It's not because we're, we're, we're fixed. It's not because we're perfect or we're not wounded. It's not because we've ironed out all of our imperfections. See, I love how God takes a, like a, a, a but statement and turns it into like, like a yet. See, God's always pointing towards the future where he loves you, the future that he wants you to walk into, the future that he has for you to realize and for you to accept. And God says, I know you're flawed. I know you're broken. I know you're sin. I know all this about you. Yet, I love you. See, that is the love of God. Therefore, is there anything on earth that can take our value from us? No. 
So there is nothing in your life that can make you feel or that can actually take your value from you. You are a valued person. You're valuable. Nothing will ever steal that from you. Things will try. I mean, this morning I sat at my desk and and Satan tried to take my value from me. Chris, if you don't have the church looking like this and running like this, no one's going to show up next week and you guys will be all by yourselves. Satan wants to come at you and take away your value. He wants to put the but statement in your head, but God's still fighting with you and for you to say, hey, yet I, I will love you. And I will always love you. So let let me tell you how much God loves you. So how how do I know how much that God loves me? How how do we know this? Again, this is where the Bible is so clear. So I want you to to focus in on this. I I don't want to get stuck into like preacher mode or sermon mode. This is is me sharing a deep burden in my my heart for you. How How do you know how much God loves you? How do we know that? See, we have the scripture that I'm going to read for you here. But this is so important for you to wrap your head around. And so if you're feeling like, hey, you know, I, I may be broken. I have a hard time accepting God's love for me. Or you know what? Even just thinking about God's love for me, it doesn't really like weigh that heavy on me. It doesn't influence me or impact me all that much. I, I want you to, to zero in on this. Now, I want you to accept this and, and to hear this, this verse here. Because God... Everything in the world tried to stop this service from happening this morning, but it still happened. And you could have been anywhere else on, on earth. You could have been anywhere, but you're not. You're here. And so you're here for a reason. And you're here on the very same day that God is trying to tell you that nothing can take your value from you because He loves you. And so how much does God love you? But this, this is Romans 5.8. But God clearly shows and proves His own love for us by the fact that while, so this is a key word, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? It means that while we were still imperfect, while we were still broken, while we were still wounded, while we were still just, just a, a, a messed up heap of human being, God died for you. God sent Jesus to die for you so that we could have a relationship with him. That, that's how much God loves us. See, if you were to take out while, if instead it was God loves us because we're good or we're perfect or we've earned it or we've paid enough money for it, that, that's not what this says. See, God loves us so much while you were a still sinner. God loves you. See, the, there's a truth about God's love. God's love is not the kind of love that looks for what is worthy in an object, but it's the kind of love that gives worth to the object. See, God's love gives worth to you. It's not looking to find the worthy part in your heart. God, God's, God is not searching your heart and your soul to see, is there a part of you that's clean or good enough or okay enough or lovable? He's not looking for that because God just has your whole heart. Because when God comes in, he makes your whole heart worthy. See, God, God does not love you because you are worthy. God's love is actually what makes you worthy. This is the truth that somebody needs to accept this morning beside me. This is the truth that you need to be reminded of on a Monday or on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. Or when life gets hard, you need to be reminded of this truth. And see, God, God's love is not just an action. It's not just something that God does. It's actually His essence. So what is the essence of God? It, it, it's the, the, the being of who He is. See, I'm trying to take you guys on a bit of a journey. First, we've talked about what love is. And I've told you that God's love for you is a love that adds value to you. And I've told you how much God loves you. God loves you so much that while you were still a sinner, God sent Jesus to die on the cross from you, meaning nothing can take your value from you. And so now it's okay, but what about who God is and the essence of who God is? Because the God that loves me that much, I want to know about him. I want to know about who he is and why he ticks and why he chooses to love me the way that he chooses to love me. And so this is the verse that tells us that. We can go to 1 John 4, 8 through 10. The one who does not love has not become acquainted with God because God is love. If you've been in, in, in the presence of God, then you've experienced God's love. See, God and love can never be separated. 
So the one who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him. For God is love. He is the originator of love. And it is an enduring attribute of his nature. And then John goes on to say, By this, the love of God was displayed in us. In that God has sent his one and only begotten son. See, here's that part again where God sends Jesus for you. The one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, into the world so that we might live through him. See, see what we're, we're, we're uncovering here is the essence of God. The essence of God's love for you. That God will relentlessly pursue you. It, it's His nature. Who God is, is the person, the, the God that wants to love you, to add value to you, to make you valuable. To make you understand how valuable you truly are. And see, John goes on in the next verse, in verse 10. In this, in this is love. Not that we are loved, not, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son to be the appropriation, that is the atoning sacrifice and the satisfying offering for our sins, fulfilling God's requirements for justice against sin and placing and placating His wrath. See, that's the essence of who God is. We never have to walk up to the wrath of God. We never have to deal with the wrath of sin because God takes it all from us. That's how much God loves you. Now, what's amazing, the, the, kind of the next point that I want to point out in this is this was written by John. John was one of the 12 disciples, and John was the brother of James. And so James and John, when they were kind of recruited by Jesus, they had a nickname, and their nicknames were that they were the sons of thunder. And, and I can imagine that they had, we don't exactly know why they were called this, but, but maybe it was because they were, maybe they were fighters, maybe they were a bit brash, uh, you know, maybe they, they kind of like walked into a situation like thunder and just took over and kind of like owned, it, owned the situation. We don't exactly know why, but we know that their nickname was Son of Thunder. Now, I think that's a pretty cool nickname, and I think to have that nickname, you probably had to do something to earn it. And so let me give you an example. When, when John first entered into relationship with Jesus, when he first started following Jesus, Luke tells us a little bit about John's personality. So in Luke 9, when his disciples, James and John, so the, the sons of thunder, when they saw this, so what's happening is Jesus has walked into a town and, and he's being, you know, he's there to, to preach and to teach and to disciple people and he's getting some pushback from the audience. He's getting pushback from the crowd. And so when James and John see that Jesus is getting this pushback, they said, Lord, do you want us to, and then they go a bit extreme, so there's no middle ground here. There's no, do you want us to pacify the audience? Do you want us to step in and speak to somebody? Do you want us to, uh, you know, to try and quiet things down? They, they, I'm wired this way, just full bore, all the way, all or nothing. And they say, do you want us to command fire down from heaven and just destroy them? I love that. I love that. There's people on the road in front of me driving slow that I think, God, do you want to just fire down from heaven and just destroy this car? Amen, Amen. exactly. <laughs> exactly. See, the, the, this was there. I, I, think, I think back to my life growing up, and, I, and, and even as I was a young professional in business, and I was a son of thunder. I was somebody that wasn't patient, wasn't compassionate, wasn't really all that kind. It was just all or nothing. Hey, if you're not on board, I'm moving forward, and you're just going to get run over and get pushed out of the way. And so James and John, when they're recruited by Jesus, this is, this is them. They're like, okay, Lord, we believe in your power. We believe in your goodness. We believe that you are the Savior. And since you've got all that at your disposal, and since we believe in you, why don't we just, just call fire down and just nail them? But see, that's the same John that wrote the verse that we read before, where John is unpacking and realizing the essence of Jesus' love for us. And see, this, this is what's amazing. And I can live this. I can attest to this. Just like John did here. Being loved by Jesus will change you over time. So when you accept that Jesus loves you, this will change you over time. 
So what that means is that, is that if you find yourself now not even able to connect with the idea that Jesus loves you, well, if you get in his presence or you spend time with him, he'll put his imprint, his thumbprint on you. It'll change you over time. If you struggle with compassion or you struggle with anger and you spend enough time with Jesus, that'll, he'll change you over time. He'll soften your heart. If you struggle with believing in yourself, with loving yourself, if you find that you're impossible to love by your own self, you spend enough time with Jesus, he'll change you over time. See, take your problems to Jesus, and he may, not change his pro- he may not change your problems, but he will change you. Take your brokenness to Jesus, and he may not heal the thing that broke you, but he'll heal your broken heart. He'll change you. So you can take your disappointment to Jesus and he may not satisfy that and give you what you think you need. But instead, Jesus will teach you that he is your ultimate satisfaction. See, we take who we are, which is that broken, that fragile, that messed up kind of ball of person that's trying to just get through the world and get through the day. And we take that to Jesus and Jesus changes it and he renews it. Now, I want to give you guys a powerful statement. So we, Casey and I, and we here at this church, we really believe in the power of words. We believe that when you speak it, you proclaim it, you call it out, and once you call it out, you can own it. So you, you, you speak it, and you own it. If you're too afraid to speak it, then you're probably never going to step into it and own it. But the, the thing is, is that sometimes we don't say things because we don't think that we could believe in them. Or we may not say something because we don't believe it. Well, if you say it, and you say it, and you say it, then it becomes truth in your life. I can prove this to you. How many of you don't find um, yourself very attractive? Well, it's because you look in a mirror every day, and you say, I'm ugly. And every time you look in a mirror, you say, what's wrong with my face? What's wrong with my body? Why don't I look better? Why don't I look different? Or how many of you don't feel like you're, you're bold enough or smart enough to speak up in a meeting? Well, that's because you spent all day, every day, telling yourself that you're not capable of doing that. You're not equipped to do that. Why did I wake up this morning and think that because we were on stage six load shedding, that the church would close down and no one would come back next week? Because I spend so much time thinking, Chris, are you good enough? Did you do good enough? Are you good enough? Well, the answer is no, I'm not. And the answer is that I will never do enough for this church. But the truth and the great, the great part of that truth is I don't have to. Because I've got a Jesus that will change me and change you over time. See, G- Jesus is what's happening here. Not Chris and not coffee. So a statement that I want you to say is is this. We'll put it on the screen. I am the one loved by Jesus. Okay, so let's, let's say that. I am the one loved by Jesus. Now, if you're new to church and, and, and this is your first Sunday with us, this is, we're not a cult and you're not committing yourself into a cult. You know, if, if you don't want to say this out loud, you, know, you don't have to say it out loud. No, no one's pressuring you to do anything at, at all. Just be easy, chill, relax. But some of us, some of us need to say this. Some of us, we, we really need to say it. Let's say it again. I am the one loved by Jesus. 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 Now, I don't know if anyone felt that. I don't know if anyone could feel something happening. I, I can. I feel it up here. I feel, I feel the power of those words, the power of that declaration. See, you know what's so special about Jesus is that God didn't shout his love from heaven. He, he showed his love from earth. See, he, he did that for us. He didn't shout his love from heaven. He showed it from earth. See, God sent Jesus for you so that you can finally answer the question, am I loved by God? And the answer to that question is yes. 
But part of what you have to do in this is you, you've got to start proclaiming some truth that's in your life. Now, the thing that gets in the way of our truth is our feelings. I, I tell Casey all the time, my feelings are just too loud. I can't hear the truth because my feelings take over. But what you have to do is you have to put truth before your feelings. And when you put truth before your feelings, then you start to accept and you start to be able to hear God and you start to be able to get into His presence. But guys, our feelings are some of our worst enemies. We can't trust our feelings. If we trusted our feelings, we'd be in a huge mess. Remember, our feelings are those warm, fuzzy things that when we fall in love because somebody said yes when we asked them out, th those are feelings like you, you can't trust those all the time. But truth is something that you can trust forever. So what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to put truth in front of your feelings. And you know one way you do that? You do that by saying, I am the one that is loved by God. When my feelings rise up and tell me that I'm worthless, I am the one that is loved by God. When my feelings rise up and I question, does God actually love me? I am the one that is loved by God. When my, when my sin happens, when I fall into that sin that I fall into over and over and over again, and I think to myself, I'm not worthy of God. Take your feelings and put them away and accept the truth. I am the one that is loved by God. See, your sin does not disqualify you from God's love. Your sin qualifies you to be chosen to receive God's love. See, I don't know about you, but what this does for me is this lets me just like <sighs> take a deep breath. And I just get to accept that God loves me. My sin doesn't disqualify me. My sin actually qualifies me to receive God's love. It's my sin that put Jesus on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. I am the one that is loved by God. I am the one that is loved by God. And so I, I hope today that as we look at this question, does God love me? I hope today that you can gain something from what I've spoken about today that you can answer this question. See, the answer is, is easy. The answer is yes. And I showed you a few verses that talk about it, but the whole Bible front to back is basically answering this question of, does God love me? The challenge that we have is getting over our feelings, getting an understanding of, of how much God values us, and because He loves us, we then become valuable, and, and how to actually just start putting that into practice in our daily life. And you can do that by every morning, or every afternoon or a hundred times a day, you claim, I am the one that is loved by God. I am the one loved by Jesus. And so I'm going to give us a chance to put this into action. And so I'm going to call the band out. They're going to lead us in a, in a last song. And when they do that, we're going to have some prayer partners that are going to come down here to the front. <clears throat> And, and I believe that maybe, maybe you need prayer because you've had a hard time answering this question, does God love me? And if that's you, then you can come down front and you can pray with somebody. Now, we're not here to answer, we're not here to solve your problems. We're not your cure. We're not your magic fix. We're, we're not going to, uh, you know, son of thunder this thing and call fire and lightning down on you. And all of a sudden, poof, everything in your life is, is over and good and done. But what we will do is we'll partner with you. And we'll stand with you in that truth that you are the one that is loved by Jesus. And if you need prayer for anything else, you can come down. There's no shame in coming down. There's no, there's no shame. And, and so we're here for you to do that. So I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to sing. And this is our moment before we go out there and life gets busy and life takes over. Please. Please, see, I, I beg of you because we don't know what happens tomorrow. We, we don't know. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. This is your opportunity to claim in your life that you are the one that is loved by Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning with this.